again, where the scriptures tell us that they will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that's why we praise his name with this excitement, with this passion, and with the, and together as his people, because he has promised, his name is a promise, that God will save his people from their sins. We're nearing the end of a saga. Find Genesis chapter 47. Genesis chapter 47, we've been working our way through the book of Genesis, and particularly through the life of Joseph this year, and it's incredible to think we are four chapters from the end. Some of y'all have been here from the beginning of our journey through this. There should be like a badge, right? Like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, I finished, I survived the Genesis saga, right? Genesis chapter 47, and we really begin to reach a high point in the life of of Joseph. Recall, two weeks ago, we were in Genesis chapter 46, and God spoke promises to an elderly Jacob, who was then over a hundred, and he was about 130 years old, and he took off to reunite with his family in Egypt. And this chapter opens with Jacob coming before Pharaoh and saying exactly what Jacob told him to say. Exactly what Joseph had told him to say. And the first 12 verses sort of serve as a recap. Sort of the, a recap at the beginning of a new episode, but then the plot begins to thicken. In the midst of their new home and a dramatic meeting with Pharaoh, we see that there is truly devastating economic turmoil in Egypt due to a famine. Egypt is seen descending further and further into devastation as the chapter goes on. But I want us to see that through it all, God was at work. And that in the midst of the famine, God was going to prove himself faithful. Let's dive in. Genesis chapter 47. So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, as our fathers were. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen, and if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Then Joseph brought in Jacob his father and stood him before Pharaoh, and, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the land of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food according to the number of their dependents. Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, since the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock, if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for their horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys, and he supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. 
the herds of livestock are our Lord's. There's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh and give us seed so that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field, and as food for yourselves and your household, and as food for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have a fifth. The land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen, and they gained possession in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the land of Jacob's years of his life were 147 years. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. This is the word of God. You may have heard the classic saying that desperate times call for desperate measures. <laughs> well, the text in front of us is full of both desperate times and desperate measures. Consider even the confession of Jacob, the patriarch of the nation of Israel. Look at verse 9. Look what he says. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. You ever felt like Jacob here? Let me speak very frankly to you as your pastor. Let me, let me just give you a heads up. The day has either come, is now here, or is coming when you will say what Jacob says here. <laughs> the day is coming when you will reach a hard point in your life and look back over it and you'll say, My life has been full, more full of trouble than full of years. I've, have I really lived and experienced life even though I am alive? You may even reach the point where you despair and long for death. And Jacob is a reminder for us that this is often the experience of God's faithful. Even consider Job, who had a very similar confession through his trials. But we must understand and believe that trials, tribulations, Famine and depressions are not signs that God has forsaken us, or that God does not love us, or that God has given up on us. Because even as Jacob would confess this, God was at work in this conversation with Pharaoh. Here's our main point of this passage. You'll see this in your notes. That God proved faithful in the famine. In the midst of all of this, as Jacob is despairing for his very life, God is proving faithful in the midst of the famine. And we see three evidences of God's faithfulness in this passage. First, we see that in the moment of Jacob's despair, that God was faithful because God provided for Israel through Joseph. That's the first thing we see. God provided for Israel through Joseph. And verse 11 and 12 makes this clear. Look, look there at verse 11. Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers, and he gave them possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's house with food according to the number.
number of their dependents. See it. God saved this family from destruction through Joseph. Remember that the family had sold Joseph into slavery. He has now ascended to the right hand of Egypt, and he is rescuing those who betrayed him. He's going to bat for those who didn't go to bat for him. He is sticking his neck out for those who stuck, his, who stuck their nose up toward him. And he even got the Pharaoh of Egypt to give them the best land to dwell in. And the land that was best was actually the land outside of Egypt, in Goshen, also called Ramesses. They lived in an outcast land. And in, verse, and in chapter 46, you'll remember, we learned that as shepherds, the brothers would actually be social outcasts. That shepherds were, were not really popular people among the Egyptians. And so you have these people living in an outcast land, a sort of an outcast a job, and they were going to live in the middle of nowhere, right? And we understand this because we know that the middle of nowhere, out in the country, not only do you have the best farmland, but honestly, you got some of the best people, and city folk just haven't figured that out yet, have they? <laughs> That's sort of what's going on in the Egyptians' mind. They sort of think about Goshen as that. That's, that's the middle of nowhere. They're living out in Shreve County, Egypt. Why would they want to live there? But Jacob and his family, they figured out the secret. They figured out that the outskirts were really the place to be. Now, they might have had concerns about this initially. Who wants to be considered an outsider in a culture, right? Yet, God was at work. God was saving them. Not only on the outside was the place where the resources were going to be the most abundant, it was also the place where Egyptian influence was going to be the least, right? God was going to keep them out of the heart of Egypt in order to keep Egypt out of their hearts. And God had a purpose in the place he put them. And ultimately, this purpose was to preserve them from Egyptian influence and to provide them with land and food in the midst of a famine, and to save them from most certain destruction. And hear this, God is a place for where he has you too. We are tempted to believe like many of the Egyptians in this day did. We're tempted to believe that being insiders, living in the city with influence and power and climbing the ladder, that that is where life is found. So many people say this, and I know I said this as I was coming of age, that, man, if I just get out of this little town, I'll begin to find life. And then you move into downtown Egypt, and you begin to see that life is not found there either, is it? And this message is one we need to hear. Life is not found in a particular geography over another, but it's found in who you know, not in where you live. It's found in the Savior you know, not in a place down the road. And the Apostle Paul, if you remember, encouraged young Timothy to not let anyone look down on you because you are young. And the message of this passage is, hey, don't let anyone look down on you for the place where you live. <laughs> don't begin to think that you're here in Trigg County and you don't even, the nearest Walmart's like 20, 30 minutes away. How could God ever be at work here? Friends, God was at work in Goshen. I don't think Goshen had a Walmart. And friends, God was at work there providing for Israel through Joseph. And friends, the culture in the world may want you to think that bigger is better and that skyscrapers, that that's where you need to be. But God has always used the lowly and the seemingly foolish for his purposes. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at this. Paul reminds us this. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. See it. God uses the lowly, the unlikely for his purposes. God, remember, used 12 fishermen who weren't the most educated
educated, most powerful. They didn't have a famous family. They didn't have a TV show or TikTok or Instagram or any of these things. And he changed the world. Have you ever felt like an outsider? Have you ever felt lowly? Have you ever felt powerless? Have you ever felt like the place you lived is keeping you from what God might have for you? Well, let me tell you this. You're the exact sort of person in the exact sort of place that God can use. If you feel unqualified, let me tell you something. You are now qualified by God to serve his kingdom. Experience his salvation and to spread it through the world. And by putting the, this family of Israel in this lowly, far-off place, he was do, God was doing something great. He was saving them. He was providing for them. Don't let anyone look down on you for being lowly or for being from the lowly land of Goshen when that was where the flourishing resources were found. God provided for Israel through Joseph, and he proved faithful in the midst of the famine. Second, we see that God preserved Egypt through Joseph. So God provided for the family of Israel as they were in this famine, but God also preserved Egypt through Joseph. Look at verse 13. It begins to take an ominous turn. You can almost hear the music begin to change. Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And what happens next is tragic. Resources were so scarce, and if you remember, Joseph had set up this program, and the Egyptian government had stockpiled all these resources for when the worst of the famine came. And in verse 13 and 14, we see that due to having no food, the people gave all their money to the government in order to buy some food. In verse 15 to 17, we said they gave all their assets, they gave their livestock and such to purchase food. That would be like selling your car, right? Selling off your vehicle and, your, and all of these other assets that you have. Verse 18 to 22, they even sold their property and their land to the government, and then the government was going to tax them 20% to stay on it and continue to use it and yield from it. And finally, in verse 23 to 26, they sold themselves into service to the government. Now, your translation may uh, use the word servant and may use the word slave, but I know seeing those words can often take us sort of aback, right? We, we begin to think about the atrocities of what happened in uh, the history of America. And I want to just tell us that what's going on in Genesis 47 is not like that. First, the, the people of Genesis 47 gave themselves willingly as sort of employees to the government in order to receive food as payment. They weren't stolen. They weren't forced. They entered into sort of a, a, almost an employment agreement. They were sort of like government employees. The government's going to give them pay and maybe even give them a pension along the way. And then we're going to get all of this from working for the Egyptian government. So imagine these people are happy, satisfied, self-employed people. And now they've got to go work, not for the local and state, but for the federal government. They were desperate. Right. <laughs> they were desperate to begin to pick up and leave everything behind and go be these employees here. And so many pastors begin to preach this passage, and I listened to other sermons this week, and they just miss the point. But this passage isn't commenting on the pros and cons of, bi of big governments or government bailouts of the economy or anything like that. Here's the point. Verse 25 is the point. And they, the Egyptians, said, you have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. That these were desperate times that called for desperate measures. The land stopped growing inside Egypt, and Joseph had the wisdom and the wherewithal to know that them gathering up this emergency fund of grain and goods was going to be good for a moment like this. And we also notice Joseph didn't simply give it away. He said, hey, if you're going to get it, you're going to either pay for it or work for it. And through it all, Joseph saved their lives. He saved a nation of people. And see the irony here. If you know that there's a book after the book of Genesis called the book of Exodus, and in that book we're going to see that the Hebrew people are going to one day be enslaved by the Egyptians, 
But Genesis reminds us that before that ever happened, the Egyptians were enslaved to a Hebrew who saved their lives. And Joseph proved to be a much better, loving, and faithful boss than the Egyptians who were cruel toward, toward the Hebrews in the book of Exodus. Consider here, being an Israelite, because this book was originally written to Israelites, they're walking through the wilderness, they don't have food around them, they're beginning to question, has God left us? Did we follow this guy Moses, and was Moses wrong about all this? And they're tempted to go, they go, let's turn this around and go back to Egypt. Let's turn this around and go back to our familiar slavery, to whatever it was. And yet the message here is, look how God humbled the Egyptian nation like that. And shows us, by extension, that the place where life is found, the place where blessing is found, the place where salvation is found, was in the son of Abraham and the promises of God. Not in Egypt, not in their power, not in their luxuries, but in the promises of God. Look back. Chapter 47, look back at verse 7 and verse 10. Something incredible happens here. So then Joseph brought in Jacob, his father. He stood him up before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Verse 10, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Here we see elderly Jacob, so weak and frail that Joseph has to bring him in and stand him up coming before the superpower of the day and blessing them. A nation of around 70 blessing a nation of likely millions. Typically only the greater blesses the lesser, right? So the message Jacob is communicating here is that, hey, we may be small, but through the promises of God, we're actually greater than you, Egypt. We may be small and seemingly insignificant and unlikely and the underdogs, but God's on our side, and that is all we need. <laughs> it may seem like Jacob and the nation of Israel were small and insignificant compared to the world's superpower of the day, yet it was this small and seemingly insignificant people that was the fountainhead of blessing and security and safety for Egypt. The God of the universe was on their side, and that was all they needed. See God's greatness and his goodness on display. See that God's been keeping his promises that he made all the way back to Abraham in chapter 12, where he says that I'm going to bless those who bless you. And he also says on the flip side, I will curse those who curse you. And that's why, hey, here the Egyptians seem to be being blessed by the Hebrews, whereas when they turn in a few hundred years and begin to oppress them, he brings plagues upon them in the book of Exodus. Here's an application for us of this. All of us need to be reminded that Egypt will never be a savior. And by that, I'm not necessarily talking about a plot of ground you can find on the map. <laughs> Many of us have other things we trust in or attempted to trust in. We're tempted to trust that the government is going to save us. We're tempted to trust that the world system and being popular and received by the world system is going to save us. Let me say this. We need to bank our hope and our trust on the true and better Joseph, the true son of Abraham, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let me say this, midterm elections are coming here, and friends, we should vote for the people we think are best to be in those positions, but hear me, not a single one of them is going to be our Savior. I haven't seen it on their signs, but I see some kind of thinking, that, well, if you just vote for me, I'm going to fix all your problems. No, 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 no. Genesis 47 is a reminder to keep it all in perspective. God is the one who holds tomorrow. He's the one who has famines that he can control and blessings he can move around. He is the one that we must trust in. And it was God who saved the Egyptians through Joseph. He preserved them through Joseph. And in doing so, he proved faithful in the famine. And here's the third way God proved faithful. He provided for Israel. He preserved Egypt. And finally, third, he propagated a nation through Jacob. He began to multiply the people. Look how the passage ends, verse 
27. Look at this. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen. They gained possession in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. It was in the midst of difficulty that a nation was born and multiplied. And God was keeping his promise in the midst of their difficulty, their pain, and their uncertainty. And I believe that Jacob actually began to see this, and through the eyes of faith, began to see the promises made to him come to fruition. What started as a command to Adam in the garden, be fruitful and multiply, turned into a promise to Abraham, I will make you fruitful, and I will multiply you. All of this was now becoming a reality right before Jacob's eyes. He's watching them flourish in the midst of unlikely circumstances. He's looking around and seeing God protect and preserve and propagate his people. And Jacob rests by faith in that promise. See, hear this. God's people rarely multiply in prosperity. This church, let me, let me even apply this here to this church. This church probably will not grow if we get comfortable and prosperous and just sort of happy where we are. God's people have never done well with prosperity and comfort. You can read throughout uh, the God, God's word to see that. But it was in the midst of famines and persecutions and wars, that's where God's people have always hit their sweet spot because we have a message that transcends it all. We have a message that is true regardless of what the news might be telling you is going on in the world. We have something that transcends it all, and Jacob experienced this firsthand. He begins to see his life come full circle. He, he spent, if you remember, Joseph was sold into slavery at 17, so he spent the first 17 years of his life with Joseph, and now we see that he's going to spend the last 17 years of his life with Joseph. God was going to bring him full circle. And far from the confession of verse 9, look where we find him in verse 29. Look at this. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt. But let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me, and he swore to him. And Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. What started in despair concluded in hope. And this may seem like a small request from, from Jacob here, but this is a big deal. Jacob could have been buried in Egypt and likely honored with a giant monument. Imagine if, if the, the sibling of a, if the father of a president were to die today. How much honor the country would give to them while they were in office. He could have had all of the, Joseph was a prominent figure, and we honor the parents of prominent figures. But Jacob knew it was better to be buried in the land that God promised him and far away from God's presence and promise. Jacob knew that he was going to live again and rise out of the grave, and he wanted to be found in the land that God promised him. He went to the grave in hope, and not without two coming chapters of blessing that he's going to do. Jacob is not done yet, but he knew that God's purposes were far greater than just his life. 140 years is a long life by any of our measurements. And yet God was doing something far greater than 140 years. And Jacob had to have his sights set on God's eternal promise. Consider how he has Joseph do what generations before him did. Abraham and Isaac had their sons place their hand on their thigh. Make a promise. And this was sort of a picture of, hey, cut off any likelihood of children if this promise doesn't work out. I think we get what, uh, what the picture is there. Make this solemn oath on the future and their family to keep their word. And what started in despair ends 
and hope. And I hope we see the encouragement that whatever you're dealing with, God is doing something behind your difficulty. He is saving people through unlikely circumstances. He is proving faithful in the famine. And he did it through Joseph, the offspring of Abraham. And the people of Israel have now migrated from Canaan, the land of promise, into Egypt, where they're going to spend hundreds of years. This isn't the end of the story. Joseph isn't the end of the story. God's going to bring them in, and he's going to bring them out. But in the meantime, they live as sojourners in a land, not their home. And that's where you find yourself. As well, we all live as followers of Jesus between two great works of God, between Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection to save, and between his return to recreate the world. And we live in the in-between by faith. And God is with us. He has brought us here. He has promised to bring us into a new and better land, into a new heavens and a new earth. And in the meantime, we live as sojourners. We dwell in a spiritual Egypt, and some of us are experiencing the famine, and some of us are in the flourishing of Goshen. But we all have to look forward in faith. May what was said of Abraham be said of us. Look at this, Hebrews 11, verse 10. For he, Abraham, and even his offspring after him, were looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder God. And in the in-between, God has proven himself faithful. He's promised to bring us back out of the land, and he's secured it through sending his son, Jesus, to die on the cross and to rise again and to stand at the right hand of heaven. And it is there that we find all true blessing, safety, salvation, and security. Don't let the promises and powers of this world you all of them are but a famine or as we've seen a pandemic away from their knees but there is one who stands at the throne of heaven unshaken and unmoved and if you don't know this savior today who rules and reigns over all things you can come to know him today you can cry out right where you are jesus i know i'm a sinner I know that I have lived in rebellion against you, and I know that on my own I can never run my way towards you. And then you can confess that you, have, that you have come to live a perfect life, to die on the cross in my place, and to rise again from the dead so that I can know you and love you and seek after you and have a hope that's unshaken through a world that is often shaken. But the question we must ask all of, our, all of ourselves is, where is our hope? And may we, in this coming time of response, set our hopes on the one who is unshaken by the world. Let's stand and let us pray together. Father in heaven, you are the one who controls all things. You control economies, you control famines, you control leaders of governments, you control our very lives, and you have even brought people here today to this tiny town, to here, to this building, to hear your word today. And you use seemingly insignificant things great purpose. You used a 17-year-old Hebrew boy to save his family and a nation and to give us an example of what the Savior of the world would do. Your son, Jesus Christ, was sold and betrayed, died on a cross in the place of sinners, and rose again in victory and stands today not simply as king over Egypt or king over America, but king over all things. And today, whether for the first time or for the hundredth time, we place our hope and our faith entirely in you. And we know that your word and promises prove true, even as the world, the world makes promises it can never be. We love you and we trust you and we offer this worship to you in response. Amen.